I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the next six weeks. This is kind of a, a pre-launch, getting ready for our next six weeks, and th- some things I want us to consider as we move forward. And I want to start with a scripture out of the book of Jeremiah 29 11. It's a very familiar scripture. Most of us have heard this scripture um, throughout our lives. If you've not heard the scripture, you're going to hear it again today. And I want to just break it down just a little bit, and then I want to go into a couple of things this morning, okay? So here's what the scripture says, Jeremiah 29 11, for I know... The plans I have for you, says the Lord. I want to stop there for just a minute because I need us to understand this. This is not somebody saying to me, this is not my dad saying to me, my mom saying to me, my pastor saying to me. This is the Lord saying to me, I know the plans I have for you. There is no question about the plan. You know, I go to my son's football game and I have a plan for him, right? I have a plan for him. This is what you're going to do, son. You're going to get the ball and you're going to score a touchdown. That's the plan, right? It don't always work out that way. I'm not the coach. I'm dad, right? So I've learned to not coach my son anymore. I bring him aside and I pray for him. Jesus, help him because you can do whatever the coach tells him to do. That's what you're going to do. So anyway, but the Lord said, I have a plan. Not your coach. The Lord said... There is a, you're not here by coincidence or by happenstance. You're not here just because you decided you're a good person. You're going to wake up in the morning. I talked to people all the time the other day. I was at the football game, and one guy said to me, he said, I feel like I'm going to be a good person today. I'm going to go to church today. <laughs> That's your plan. But God already had a plan. So before you had that thought, God put a seed in your heart already because he has a plan for you. You may think it's your plan, but it ain't your plan. It's the Lord's plan. Okay, so anyways, God has a plan. I just want you to grab a hold of the idea that God has a plan for you. And here's what he says. There are plans for good and not for disaster. You ever felt like, God, if your plan is good and not for disaster, then why did I lose my job? Why can't I afford my house payment? Why can't I, right? All these things happen and we feel like we're going through a disaster when God says, I have plans for good. Anybody ever ask yourself that question? I know I have. Like, God, if you're good and you have a plan for me, why am I going? It's because I can't, I can't see the, 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 the progress through the pain I'm going through sometimes. Right? And sometimes, sometimes it really help, it helps for us to understand God's plan. In the next six weeks, I think we're going to start to discover God's plan. Right? And so sometimes what you think is a disaster isn't really a disaster. What you think is a disaster is really God's molding and shaping us to be the men and the women God has called us to be. So quit looking at the pain like, oh, my God, it hurts so much. Look at the pain. Through, like, God, there's a bigger picture out there. My wife talked about the piece of the puzzle. It's the only piece of the puzzle. You'll be all right. We're, we're going to get through. We're going to get through. So anyways. <laughs> to give you a future and hope, God's plan is for us to have future and hope, but it's not about me. See, sometimes we think God's plan is about me. Like, God, why ain't I on the stage? Don't you know I can speak better than Pastor Eli? I can speak better than Pastor Lee. I can lead worship better than Pastor Teresa, Eden. Jo- I can lead children. It's not, the plan isn't about me. The plan is about somebody else waiting to hear about the good news inside of you, regardless of the platform you're on. You can be in your car driving your coworker to work, and that's a platform God has given you to give the gospel out. You don't need a platform for that. God's plan is good and a hope not for me, but for the others around me. When you're walking through the aisle at Walmart or, or Safeway, God's plan is working itself out in that aisle. It's good not for me, for them, for others. And really, the next six weeks is what can we do to be hope? To create a future, not only for ourselves, but for the people around us. So preparing my message over this last week, um, I remembered something I learned when I was in school. I remembered that in school I was taught that early, in our early civilization, we believed that um, the sun revolved around us. Like we were the only thing on the planet, like the earth was all there was. That's all we knew, right? And so everything revolved around us. We were the biggest planet. We were the biggest thing. We were, we were us, and everything revolved around us. Well, as we progressed and we got more knowledge and God gave us wisdom, we discovered that we don't revolve around the sun at all. I mean, the sun doesn't revolve around, us, revolve around us at all. We revolve around the sun. And really, we're only a small planet in a larger galaxy. Right? Well, sometimes... We go backwards, and we believe that the sun still revolves around us. 
I'm not talking about the Son in the universe. I'm talking about the Son, Jesus. That's why we go to God, to Jesus, with our wish lists. Right? God, if you just give me a million dollars. God, if you just make my son rich. God, if you just move on my wife's heart. God, if you just make my husband right. We're always asking God for stuff as if God revolves around our needs. The sun does not revolve around us. We revolve around the sun. Our prayer is, God, what can I do for you? God, what do you need me to do? Because in discovering that we revolve around the sun, God begins to bless our lives. As long as we believe that the sun revolves around us, our lives will be dissatisfied because of unmet expectations. God, I expected you to do this, and because you didn't do it, then I'm angry with God. I shake my fist at God. God, why did I have to go through this, or why did I have to go through that? Because we still believe that the sun revolves around us. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about accomplishing the plan that he has set out for me. What's the plan that God has set out for each and every one of us? I believe that God has set out an individual plan for us, right? But I also believe that God has set out a corporate plan for us, a body plan for us. God has called us to take over territory. God has called us to reach the nation. God has called us to preach the gospel. God has called us to look at our friends, our neighbors, and our co-workers and give them life, not death. That's the greater plan than anything we could ever want or wish for our own selves. And when we discover that, when we understand that, I believe that we will live a satisfied and fulfilling life. Amen? So that's an intro, okay? That was an intro. So I want to give you four things this morning, four things as we begin to discover God's plan for us. Because here's here's what I know. That when you start to discover, when we start to discover what God's plan for us, and we start walking on that plan, the enemy is going to attack. Because the enemy doesn't want us to understand why we're here. The enemy doesn't want us to get this idea, this picture, that there is a bigger plan than just myself. Because when we start discovering that, when we start walking down that road, he's going to start attacking us on every angle, on every side. Like, you know, I went on this journey. um, I I went on this, you guys have all... At some point or another, tried one of these weight loss programs. Why is it that as soon as you start trying to go and get your weight better or try to get healthier, you're attacked with chocolate cake? Right? Like, like I haven't heard nobody talk about uh, 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 German chocolate cake, and I don't know how many, how, I haven't even seen one in years. All of a sudden, I go to a friend's house, and they German chocolate. I'm like, what the world? Where does it come from? Because I'm, I'm walking this planet. All of a sudden, this stuff starts coming. Around. Anybody ever feel like that? As we begin to discover God's plan for us, the enemy is going to attack. Right? He's going to try to bring things, discouragement. God, why are my kids acting weird? I mean, that's always time, but, you know, but why, why, why more this time? Why my husband acting funny? Why my wife acting funny? Why my, why my boss acting like that? Why did he treat me wrong? Why am I... Listen, because we're discovering our plan. God is working stuff out in us. And so I want to give you four things to consider as we start this journey. And, and I'm going to use I'm gonna use our holiday um, experiences. Okay, so we just finished Labor Day, right? Just had a day off for labor. It was awesome. When I used to work at a, at a fruit company, Labor Day falls at the beginning of harvest. And so I asked my boss, hey, are we going to get Labor Day off? He said, uh, it's Labor Day. That's a day of labor. No, you working. Right? We work in. Sometimes we get, we get comfortable and we think, well, when's the next day off? When's the next time to rest? Labor day. And here's point number one. Point number one is have a labor day mentality. John 9, 4 says like this, as long as it is day, we must do the work he has sent us to do. As long as there's breath in mind, I'm not talking about the day as the sun in the air, right? I'm talking about as long as there is day, as long as there's life in me, as long as there's breath in my lungs, there is work that God has called me to do. What is the work God has called me to do? It's time to labor. It's time to work for the kingdom and rest if you need to. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I don't think that we should be working ourselves to death. I think you need to rest. The Bible, Jesus gave us this example of resting on the Sabbath. Some of us are workaholics and we need to rest. Some of us rest too much and never work, right? We need to follow the example God gave us, right? We need to work and then rest, 
not rest and rest and rest and rest, then I work. No, no, like, you know, like we, my kids are always like, man, Malachi said, have you ever worked, have you ever slept, have took a good nap? I mean, such a good nap. You were so tired from your nap, you had to take another one? That's called laziness, son. Okay, no, you got to get up and work, right? So, so, so have, a, have a Labor Day mentality. We have to work while we still can rest when necessary and understand this, that your labor is not in vain. Your work is not in vain. So my wife and I um, recently had to move. And so in this move, we were trying to figure out where we were going because we didn't know where we were going. We're like, okay, God, our, our, our landlord sold the house. We knew it was coming. We just know how fast it was coming, and he didn't even tell us until I, told, I called him. I'm like, hey, I just want to know what's going on. He's like, oh, by the way, we sold the house. Really? Yeah, you got 30, you got October 1st to be out, and we're trying to find a place. Anyways, we're trying to find a place, and, trying to get, and so we're, 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 we're moving and, and trying to figure this thing out, and God brings this house into our lives, right? It's an amazing home. It's beautiful, and we start moving. We start moving stuff, and we start seeing things that we didn't see, and we, we, we discover things we didn't know we had, stuff we got to get rid of, right? But in the move, watch this, in the move, you start to put things in different order. Like now it's clean, now it's fresh, now it's new. Because we have, look, if you're going to have something fresh and new, you got to work. You got to work. We gotta, okay, look, my wife's going to laugh. I have this sock. My favorite pair of socks. And I found one and I can't find the other one. So I take that one sock and I put it in my sock drawer because I know that sock is somewhere in the house. So we start moving. We're working. I pull the dryer out. Guess where my sock is? <laughs> Behind the dryer. So I'm like, I found my sock. Yes. All of my labor was not in vain. If it was just to find my sock, I am good. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, listen, listen. I know it's funny, right? But there is somebody in your life who is waiting for you to move some stuff around in your life who is lost. And is waiting for us to say, they're waiting. They're behind a dryer somewhere. They're under a couch somewhere. And they're waiting for you to move some stuff in your life, to get uncomfortable, to labor a little bit so their lives can be saved. God is going to use you to do that. Number one, have a Labor Day mentality. Number two, number two, avoid Halloween tactics. John 10.10 10 says like this, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give you life, a life rich and satisfying. How does the enemy steal, kill, and destroy? I believe one of the ways the enemy steals, kills, and destroys is by trying to question our identity. At Halloween, we put on costumes. We put on masks to try to get somebody to give us a piece of candy. I mean, not adults, not you adults. Well, <laughs> some of you adults. Some of us don't do it anymore. Some of you all dressing up as teenagers to get some candy. Anyway. But here's, here's what I felt the Lord tell me about Halloween tactics. Quit trying to pretend to be somebody you already are. We try to be superheroes. You already are. You try to be a police officer or a fireman. You already are. We take this one day to try to pretend to be somebody. You already are. God has already called you. His words that you are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. The enemy is trying to, uh, to, to, to get us to question our identity. We don't need to question our identity. Jesus said, I am good enough. I'm not here by coincidence or happenstance. You are not a mistake. You are here because God designed you and planned you. Right? And so sometimes the enemy comes in and, and, and tries to discourage us or distract us by questioning who we are. Sometimes we got to take the masks off. Try to be, you know, sometimes we're one person in front of this person and one, you all know who that person is, right? And one person is like in front of you, they're the, what, this area, they act like this, but then they get around these friends over here and they act like a totally different person, putting masks on, several masks on, trying to fit in the crowd, right? Don't be that guy. Don't be that. Be the woman God has called you to be. Be the man that God has called you to be. Be above and not beneath. Be the head and not the tail. Live in victory. Take the mask. And watch this last thing right here on this Halloween piece. 
know your value. Know your value. We have too many young people especially who are questioning their value. Value is not found in the kicks you wear. Value is not found in the watch you wear. Value is not found in the clothes you wear. Value is found in the word of God. Value is found in understanding that the sun doesn't revolve around me. I revolve around the sun. That I am part of a plan that's much bigger than my own plan. I'm not going to get a career so that I can do things for me. I'm going to get a career because I need to fulfill the plan of God. So if I'm going to be a, a, an attorney, if I'm going to be a doctor, if I'm going to be a, a police officer, if I'm going to be a, whatever it is that your, your career is, a bar, I don't know what your career, whatever that career is, God, how are you going to use me in this career, Father, to reach somebody, to preach the gospel, to give the good news? Quit questioning your, your identity is not found in whatever your job is. Right? You can be the janitor at... at, at, at at the school, you got to go through and clean up the kids' mess in the locker rooms, and it's stinking. You're like, God, why am I here? Your identity's not in the janitor. You're there because you're praying over those lockers as you're walking through. Because God is going to use you to reach a young man or a young lady in the school you're at as a teacher. Whatever it is that you do, God is going to use you. That, isn't, that is not your identity. Your identity is son of God, daughter of God. That's your identity. That's what God has called you to be. Okay? So don't feel like you're less than. Don't let the enemy trick you. And to making you feel like you're less than what God has already called you to be. That's number two. Number three, running out of time. Always have a heart of thanksgiving. Psalms 28, 7 says like this, The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust him with all of my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. Thankfulness is not a result of circumstance. Thankfulness is a condition of of the heart. How could David recite, how could David be thankful when so many things are going wrong in his life? Because circumstances don't determine thankfulness, my heart does. And when my heart is filled with the joy of the Lord, I can lose my job and be thankful. When my heart is filled with the joy of the Lord, I can lose some money and be thankful. When my heart is filled with the joy of the Lord, my landlord can call me and tell me I got to move and I'm going to be thankful because my heart is thankful because it's filled with the joy of the Lord. In this season, as we go and we embark on these uh, uh, next six weeks in discovering what God has called us, know that the enemy is going to come in and he's going to try to discourage and distract. But I'm thankful. Bring on what you got to bring, devil. Bring on what you got to bring, enemy. I am thankful. Here's what Paul said. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. I am thankful. Paul also said, I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's like to have something. In everything, I'm going to be thankful. Got to be thankful got to have a heart of thankfulness. We're going into Thanksgiving season. Let's be thankful for what God is doing in our lives. There are people, listen, there are neighbors, there are co-workers, there are family members who are going to come to know Jesus because of our uh, uh, pursuit for discovering who we are. Be thankful. In this season, God, I'm, I'm, look, right now, here's what you need to pray. God, I'm thankful for Johnny, for, for, for Jim, and, and for George, Jace. I'm thankful right now, God. I, I know they, they, they don't even see it coming right now, but God, would you prepare the way now? God, that before I even say a word to them, before I even invite them to my host group, God, that even right now you're tilling the ground of their heart. I'm thankful, God, that they're going to see the light of Jesus and you're going to use me. God, I am thankful. Amen? So, so whatever they are, begin to call their names out even now. Maybe you're not going to host, open up a host group, but you're going to attend a host group. That's okay. You can still call their names out. Invite them to your host group. Invite them to your life group. Be thankful in this season for what God is about to do, not only in your individual life, but in this corporate body. I am thankful, God, for what you're doing at Changing Point Church. I'm thankful, God, because I can't see it right now, but I know that wall's coming out. I'm thankful, God, I can't see it right now, but I know that building on the other side, that C4 building, it's going to be a, a filled with young people who are going to be crazy for Jesus. God, I'm thankful. I can't see it right now. But for I thank you for CP Kids, God, and all the things that you're bringing into there and all those kids who are loving Jesus over there and for that team. God, I'm thankful, God, because this projector is going to go away and we're going to get a bigger projector and we're going to get... I am thankful. I can't see it right now, but I'm thankful, God, because you're about to do it. Got to walk in thankfulness. Got to walk in thankfulness. And here's the last thing. Oh, I'm not done yet. Hang on. Thankfulness. Sometimes, 
we feel like, but you don't understand, Pastor Lee, I'm going through stuff. And it's hard to be thankful when your, <clears throat> your wife leaves you. It's hard to be thankful when your, <clears throat> your husband leaves you. It's hard to be thankful when your kids are going through stuff that you can't help them with. Like, you ever had a, a sick kid? Ever had a sick kid and you wish that you could take their place? Don't wish that. That's not your burden to bear. That's their burden to bear. I'm thankful, God, that you're bringing healing, God, and you're going to use me and my hands to touch my children to pray. I don't want to take their place, but I know a God who's already took their place. I'm thankful. So, here, so sometimes we think this. We think, we think that, you know, thankfulness can be robbed from us. Thankful is not robbed from us. Thankfulness is something we lay down sometimes because of circumstance. Sometimes we lay thankfulness down and we pick up greed. Sometimes we lay thankfulness down and we pick up selfishness. Sometimes we lay thankfulness down and we pick up entitlement. We can't, listen to me, we cannot lay thankfulness down because we're going through something in life. Otherwise, we become selfish, we become greedy, and we become entitled. We go back to this mentality that the sun revolves around me. No, the sun doesn't revolve around me. I revolve around the sun. And God, I am thankful for the circumstance I'm in right now. Because God, you're molding and shaping. Something is going to come of this. Amen? All right. Now let's move on. Number four. Number four. Have a Christmas expectation. Proverbs 10, 28 says like this. The expectation of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Expectation, I heard it like this when I was in Bible college. Expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. Remember that, Lou? Expectation is the breeding ground. If I don't have an expectation, then what am I doing? Maybe the reason we ask the question, what on earth are we here for, is because we have no expectation. I know what I'm here for. I have an expectation, God. I have an expectation you're going to move on my life. I have an expectation, God, that you're going to bless me like the Word of God says, pressed down, shaken, and running over. There's an expectation in my heart that my children are going to be successful. They're going to leave a legacy. There's an expectation in me. Right? Because that's what the Word of God, Christmas expectation, there were Waiting for a Savior. The Savior came, and some of them reject the Savior. Listen, we have to expect the Savior. The Savior is going to come and embrace the Savior. Embrace what you have coming to you. Embrace the gift that God's bringing to your life. Your children, your wife. I sat here yesterday, and I witnessed a 50-year wedding celebration. It was awesome. 50 years. I sat in my chair, and I was crying. I'm thinking, God. I want to make 50 years. I want to celebrate. But listen, there has, there has to be an expectation in my heart that I'm going to make 50 years. If I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, you know, I hope I can make 50 years. There's no expectation. Good luck. There's an expectation I put on my life. There's an ex expectation I put on my marriage. There's an expectation I put on my family. There's an expectation I put on my, 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 my career. There's an expectation. And, and we move forward to that expectation. Right? Expectation is progressive. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me explain that to you. Expectation, we do this often. I have this goal. I had this goal, and I reached my goal. Right? Um, I'm going to use health as an example again. We always use health. I don't know why it just comes up. We use health as an example. So I have this expectation. I have this goal. I'm going to lose, I don't know, 10 pounds. I lose 10 pounds, and what do we do when we lose those 10 pounds? Celebrate! I lost 10 pounds. Yeah, buddy. Miners, here I come. And now I got 20 back. <laughs> there you go. Miners does a good job of exchanging your expectation for a bad expectation. Right? Listen, expectations are progressive. When you reach a goal, what's the next one? The next goal. Five more. Put it back on. In my, whatever it is. But in life, when you reach a goal, when you have an expectation, don't let, don't, don't get blindsided by the expectation. Like I see this in moms, especially young moms. We got five kids, and so we, we got a little bit of experience. We kind of figured this thing out a little bit. Um, but I see young moms, like, and they're walking around, and, oh, this pretty little belly, and the little baby, when it comes out, it's going to be so cute. But then that baby's crying and screaming. Like the first time my oldest pooped, there was an expectation that wasn't one of them. The first time one of my kids had the runs, 
and mommy wasn't home and I was home with them all by themselves, what do you do? Throw them in the tub. <laughs> there ain't no fixing that thing, man. Just throw it in the tub. Dunk it a couple of times. That'll be all right. <laughs> that was not part of the expectation, right? But sometimes we get blindsided by the expectation, right? Like, God, I want a blessing. God blesses you and you don't know how to handle the blessing. We don't know what to do with it. What am I going to do with this thing? Now I, there's another expectation. My expectation, I, so, so we, we, you know, we've been, we've been in this a little bit. So my oldest is now at college, right? He's, he's, he's first year at, at Central over there. J-Box doing a great job. And, but that's, that, that's an, and now it's not just that. Now what's the next thing? In only a couple of years, you're going to be married. You're going to have kids. I'm going to be a grandparent at some point, a long time from now, J-Box. <laughs> but there's, there's other expectations. So, so listen to me. Progr- expectations are progressive. What is God calling you? Listen, some of you are going to open up a host group. Y'all going to open up a host group. Super proud of you. Super awesome. A little bit scary. But don't end with a host group. What's next? Because there are other things that are next here at Changing Point Church. There's steps that you can take to progress, to have more expectations, to do more. It's not okay to just come and work in the park. I mean, it's cool. You want to be a parking lot? That's awesome. I love that. But, man, we don't want you just to stay there. I want you to grow. Grow that ministry. Grow yourself. Start another ministry, right? There are places for you to serve here at Changing Point Church. We want to grow. We don't want to just have what we have here. We want to do so much more than here. But it's you having the expectation on your life and then saying, God, what's my next thing? What's my next thing? What's my next thing? So expectations are progressive. Amen? All right. Here's where I want to end today. Set some new expectations for your life. Set some new expectations for your life. Where are you at now in your walk with God? Where are you now in your relationship with your family, your children? Where are you now in your career? Where are you now in your giving? Where are you now? Set some new expectations. Set some new goals for yourself. You know, as I was preparing this, I was talking to Pastor Eli. Pastor Eli, help me put some things together. I'm always grateful for Pastor Eli and his wisdom. Listen, if you ever... Um, ever need wisdom, that's the man you want to go to. See the star on his hat? You follow that star, and it'll, 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 take, it'll take you where you need to go. I just had to throw that in there, Pastor, sorry. As, as we were talking about this, <clears throat> it's okay, don't choke. It's okay, don't choke. No, nobody will give you the Heimlich, it's okay. As we were, as we were, as we were talking about this, we're talking about Christmas, you know, and expectations and whatnot. And, and, and here's, what, here's what we pastor gave me I thought was just so powerful, man. You know that we celebrate Santa Claus at Christmas time. But we only get to celebrate Santa Claus because somebody puts the suit on. Right? If nobody put the suit on, we wouldn't have a Santa Claus to celebrate because old St. Nick ain't around no more. But we want to continue to celebrate him. And so somebody makes the sacrifice of putting the suit on so that we can have Santa Claus. I love Santa Claus and I love Christmas. I think it's awesome. But there is something far more important than Santa Claus. There is a celebration when somebody receives Jesus in their heart. But my wife quoted a scripture earlier. Yeah, absolutely. There's a celebration. Absolutely. My wife quoted a scripture earlier. I said, how will they know unless somebody says something? How will they hear unless somebody puts the suit on? There is somebody in your life who is waiting for you to put on your suit, your host group leader suit. I'm talking to somebody this morning. You've been kind of on the fence thinking, ah, I'm not sure if I want to do it. You know, I got a lot of friends, but, you know, I'll get that response. Listen, somebody is waiting for you to put on that suit of the gospel. Put on that suit of the gospel so that their lives could be radically changed and influenced by the Jesus inside of you. And so I want to encourage you today, number one, to remind you that your labor is not in vain. You don't need to put a mask on. You don't pretend to be somebody you're not. You don't need to be your life group leader. You need to be your host group leader. You need to be you. Your friends want you, not some fake you. They want you. Number three, there's a reason to be thankful. People are going to come into your life and into your home. And number four, there's an expectation that God is putting on you. There's an expectation that God is putting on you. And then over the next six weeks, we're going to discover 
why on earth we're here. And I believe that God is going to bring people into your life. That God's going to allow you to help discover that. And we are grateful for that this morning. Amen.